Single replacement reactions. This is very easy to confuse with double replacement reactions just because they have similar names. But what you need to remember in single replacement reactions, as we will see on the next slide, is that one element is going into a compound, one element is coming out of a compound. And it's all based on the activity series. This is essential to understand single replacement reactions. Of course, you need to get used to seeing the activity series in different ways. Each of these, we still see that certain metals like potassium are very active, magnesium very active, whereas zinc, for example, iron, mid-range, and then copper, silver, gold are among the least reactive. If you notice, these are all in one column of the periodic table. Copper, silver, and gold have very similar chemical behaviors based on the arrangement of their electrons. This is the one I'll be using for this particular set of uh, slides, but there are certainly others that you may reference. Again, we have the metals. Hydrogen is included with the metal. If you look at the periodic table, hydrogen is in group one. We also have the halogens, which they follow the same order that you would see on the periodic table, fluorine being the most active, iodide being the, late, the least active. As I said, all single replacement reactions are redox reactions. Oxidation numbers we discussed earlier, they do change on atoms in these particular equations. What's happening is the more active element that is compared to a compound, the more active element is going to become an ion. We'll take a look at a couple of those as we go forward. This is a typical simple redox reaction. This is one that was actually used quite a while ago to generate electric current, where you have one of these reactions happening in one solution, one, one container, and you have another reaction happening in another container, you can actually get an electric current, which we will see in a lab that's coming up fairly soon. You really need to understand what we're looking at here. So this is a very condensed form for a slightly more complex scenario. We have zinc as a metal. It's a solid zinc. Oxidation number is zero for all elements. So zinc's charge is zero in this case. We have copper, two sulfate. So copper has a plus two charge. It is an ionic compound. It is dissolved in water. When it dissolves in water, it is the ion of copper two and the sulfate ion are both floating around in an aqueous solution. What happens is when I drop the zinc into copper 2 sulfate solution, zinc will become the ion. If I were to evaporate out the liquid for the aqueous solution, I would find zinc sulfate. If I were able to completely put enough zinc into the solution to take out all of the copper 2 sulfate. Of course that's difficult in the perfect in a in a real world scenario. And then we get copper coming out. The copper has a zero charge. So copper went from a plus 2 charge to zero. The only way that could happen is if copper gained two minus charges to cancel out these two plus charges, which means it gains two electrons. Zinc goes from a zero to a plus two, therefore it needed to lose two negative charges. We'll look at that a little more closely right here with the half reaction method of handling redox reactions. In this per first situation, zinc with a zero charge becomes zinc two ion or zinc ion and it lost two electrons to get there. So we would say that zinc is oxidized. This is the oil in your oil rig, oxidation is loss. This is the Leo. In your loss of electrons is oxidation. The other component of this, if one atom is losing electrons, another has to gain them. So copper 2 gains two electrons to become elemental copper with a zero charge. We say that copper is reduced. When it gains electrons, when the, the positive charge is it goes down, that means that copper is reduced. When the positive charge goes up, then zinc is oxidized. So reduction really comes from 
metalworking of iron ore, but you can think of reduction being that the positive charge on an ion goes down or a zero charge goes down even further below zero as a negative charge. That, if that's helpful, that's a way to remember it. And this is reduction is gain or gain of electrons is reduction. You have your oil rig or Leo says Gur. Leo the lion says Gur. These are your two half reactions to show that actually one more active metal became an ion. The less active metal became the element. So the more active metal went into the solution. That is your overall reaction. That's what really happened. Okay, Sulfur was just here to balance the charges. Did sulfur actually do anything? No. It did nothing in this reaction. Sulfur went in, sulfur came in, looks exactly the same. So we call that a spectator ion, which is even more important when we get to double replacement reactions. So keep in mind that hydrogen is a group 1 element. The old way of doing this was to call it group 1A. I explained that in another video as well used to be the representative elements, group 1A, group 2A, and then group 3A was aluminum with three valence electrons, group 4A was carbon with four valence electrons, group 5A started with nitrogen, group 6A started with oxygen, group 7A started with fluorine, those were the halogens, and then we had the group 8A, which were the noble gases. The transition elements were referred to as a B group, now it's kind of fallen out of favor, so we just have group 1. But group 1 and group 1A mean exactly the same thing. This is a, another single replacement reaction. And I see that I did one thing incorrect here, so let me fix that. Not sure even how that happened. Just a little bit of an oversight, but let me fix. Okay... That looks a lot better. So aluminum, this is an unbalanced reaction. I want to just take a moment to look and really understand what's going on. So aluminum is a metal with a zero charge. Hydrochloric acid is a molecule, but it also has a lot of a behavior of a metal because hydrogen has a very low electronegativity, 2.1. Chloride, chlorine has a 3.0. Hydrogen would take the place of something like sodium and sodium chloride. When sodium chloride dissolves in water, it becomes ions. The same thing happens with acid. So hydrochloric acid becomes a hydrogen ion and becomes a chloride ion in solution. Hydrochloric acid is a very strong acid. It dissociates completely so that you have hydrogen ions and chloride ions floating around in the water. Now, these two have to change into aluminum chloride. How do I know it's aluminum chloride? Because by now we should remember that aluminum has a plus three charge. I have three chlorides in order to balance that. That's the only way I can have a stable formula unit when all of the charges balance out. And then hydrogen gas has a zero charge. Now, this is currently not balanced. What I need to do is find a way that I can get three chlorides minimum over here. I need, to, But I need to do it in a way that I can also make hydrogen molecules, which are composed of two hydrogen atoms. This is how the hydrogen molecules exist in nature. You cannot have hydrogen ions gaining an electron and moving around by themselves. So... We won't worry about any redox until we completely balance this. But based on what we know so far, we know hydrogen has a plus one charge, chloride has a minus one charge. When aluminum has a plus three charge, chloride has a minus three charge. I have three chlorides in order to balance my aluminum, and then I have my hydrogen. So, ooh, and that animation didn't quite go as I had planned. But what I had intended to show you was that for three chlorides, I need a minimum of three hydrochloric acids because I need one chloride from each formula unit of hydrochloric acid or each molecule of hydrochloric acid. I need a chloride in order to get all of those chlorides. Now, if I have 
three chlorides here, and I have three hydrogens. Let me go back a little bit. For three chlorides and three hydrogens, I can't get any whole number of hydrogen gas molecules. And I need two hydrogen atoms in order to make one molecule. Here I could make one hydrogen gas molecule and I'd have one hydrogen atom without a partner. And that, that can't happen in nature. The way this equation needs to be set up is that every single um, reactant needs to find each other and turn into product. That's how we write a balanced equation. I can't have any hydrogen atoms left over. I can't have um, more chlorides just sitting around doing nothing. It has to be balanced. So I know I need three chlorides. If I do just three hydrogen chlorides, I don't have the right ratio in order to make all hydrogen molecules because this has to be something that's whatever number over here has to be divisible by two. If I do instead of three hydrogen ions, I do six hydrogen ions. Now I'm in a better set situation because H2, H2, H2. I can make three molecules here. If I have now, six hydrochloric acids, I'm going to need an additional three chlorides in order to make that happen. If I now have six chlorides on the right side, I need six chlorides on the left side. And this aluminum, which showed up way too early, I was going to need that aluminum because if I have six chlor I have, I have three chlorides, one aluminum can balance them. If I have six chlorides, now I need two aluminum ions to balance those charges. This is starting to look like I'm getting somewhere. Now, with the three sets of hydrogen atoms, which is H2, 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 I make three hydrogen molecules. And the last thing I would need, I have six chlorides, six chlorides, six hydrogens, six hydrogens, because two, two, two. I have two aluminums, now I need my last aluminum. Everything is now balanced. I have a balanced equation which looks like this. Two aluminums, six hydrochloric acids will yield two aluminum chlorides and three hydrogen gas. And notice the ratio. These are not all divisible by any number. The, low, the lowest, this is the lowest whole number ratio of one atom to another, one molecule to another, one mole of atoms to another. What this is telling me is for six mole, I'm sorry, for two moles of aluminum, I would need six moles of hydrochloric acid minimum in order to make two moles of aluminum chloride and three moles of hydrogen gas. Or for two atoms of aluminum, I could use six, <coughs> excuse me, atoms or formula, atoms, I'm sorry, six molecules of hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid. I would make two formula units of chlor aluminum chloride and I would make three molecules of hydrogen gas. Now that it's balanced, I could actually look at my half reactions and see that aluminum going from a neutral zero charge to a plus three, it has to be oxidized. Again, this is the more active metal in my activity series. So I have two aluminums with a three plus charge. They came from two aluminums with a zero charge. That means I have an overall plus six charge here that's accomplished by removing six electrons from aluminum the two aluminum atoms that we started with. Those six electrons find the six hydrogen ions that I have up here in my hydrogen chloride. They join with six electrons and they make three molecules of hydrogen. Hydrogen will not be happy as single atoms, but it will be happy as molecules. So the hydrogen comes bubbling out of the solution. I take a piece of aluminum metal, I drop it in hydrochloric acid, I make an aqueous solution of aluminum chloride, which I would only see if I evaporated out my water. And I would also make hydrogen gas bubbling out of the solution. Now, there are situations in single replacement where there is no reaction. And in this situation, you need to understand, lead is the less active metal. The rule is the more active metal will be the ion. Magnesium is here a two plus ion. How do I know? Because it's joined as a formula unit with two chlorides, which are both negative. Lead is far less active than magnesium. So magnesium will stay the ion and lead will 
just sit in the solution. Really what your products are, are still, if I put in lead and I put in magnesium chloride, I'm going to get out lead and magnesium chloride. Could I say that as well? Sure, but really just NR, no reaction. We have seen zero evidence of any reaction. No precipitate, no color change, no, no bubbles, no, no temperature change. The lead would just sit there in the magnesium chloride solution. We also have the halogens. Now, what you need to understand, metals will exchange electrons with other metals. We saw previous to this, we saw copper and our zinc giving electrons to copper 2 ion. So those are two metals, they will exchange electrons. The second example, we saw aluminum give electrons to hydrogen. Same idea. Metals will give metals, electrons to other metals. Metals will give electrons to hydrogen. But non-metals, except for hydrogen, non-metals will only exchange electrons with other non-metals in redox single replacement reactions. So in this particular case, potassium is an ion. Potassium is a metal ion. Chloride, chlorine is a non-metal. Iodide is a non-metal. Iodine, chlorine is a non-metal. This has to happen between the halogens. This cannot happen with potassium. Potassium will not give electrons. It will not lose electrons. On both sides of this equation, potassium has a plus one charge. It did nothing with the ions. So if I look a little more closely, I see potassium ions. I see iodide. I see potassium again. I see chloride. Don't forget, chlorine is when it is an element. Chloride is when it gets a minus one charge. Iodine is when it's an element, and iodide is when it gets a minus one charge. I need to balance this. So I have two chlorines as reactants. I need to get two chlorides out of this. For there to be two chlorides, I also need two potassiums to balance the chlorides. I'll also notice that I have two iodines over here. That means I needed to start with two iodides and two potassiums. This is my balanced, the way, this is the way that I balance the equation. So with my formula, if I look at the half reaction method first, I'm getting two iodides. They're changing into iodine, which is Hofbrinkel. This is one of the diatomic elements. Iodine is oxidized to, I'm sorry, iodide is oxidized to iodine. And... Chlorine is reduced to chloride, okay? So iodide is when it has a negative charge. Iodine is when it's the element. Chlorine is when it's the element. And chloride is when it's the polyatomic anion. Now, I didn't actually balance this as I had intended, but this the balanced reaction equation here would be two chlorines plus, I'm sorry, would be chlorine gas plus two potassium iodides would yield two potassium chlorides and one iodine. I probably should just take a moment to balance this equation correctly. So my final equation would look like this. I have two potassium iodides, I have two potassium chlorides, I have one chlorine gas, I have one iodine coming out. And as we can see, the potassiums do not do anything from one side to the other. No exchange of electrons. Iodine is, iodide is oxidized to iodine, chlorine is reduced to chloride, potassium does nothing, that is my spectator ion. And that is single replacement reactions, a little bit of a closer look.